Welcome back to The Laundry, everyone. Today, we have a prominent guest with us, Bruce Viney, the Director of Financial Crime Compliance Training at CCL Academy, a leading compliance training provider. Bruce is a seasoned compliance professional with nearly 40 years of experience in the financial services industry and financial institutions such as Standard Chartered Bank. He has an impressive track record of analyzing, designing, and implementing global training programs for Tier 1 banks and FTSE 100 companies across the globe. And in today's episode, we will delve into the complex world of trade-based money laundering. Our discussion with Bruce will cover the intricacies of TBML, the methods used by criminals to manipulate trade for illicit gains, the challenges faced by financial institutions, and the role of technology in combating this ever-evolving threat. Get ready for an insightful and information-packed episode. So, without further ado, let's dive in and unravel the hidden world of trade-based money laundering. Welcome to the show, Bruce. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. And it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us today. So let's just start by giving our listeners a brief overview of trade-based money laundering and how it's connected to organized crime. So why don't you start with just briefly explaining what trade-based money laundering is and how does it differ from normal or other forms of money laundering? Fine, I'm very happy to do that. So trade-based money laundering, as its name implies, is based around global trade. Uh, that's the trade that goes on shipping goods and services right across the globe. You see them in ships in container ports. You see airplanes taking this. This will be by road. All sorts of trade goes on all the time. And the amount of trade transactions are huge in terms of volume which is therefore an attractive area for money launderers. Trade is something that banks particularly get heavily involved in. They might get involved indirectly through open account trading, which basically means buyers and sellers doing deals with each other and using their bank accounts to pay each other. So banks get involved indirectly that way. That's for about 80% of trade, but for the rest of trade, banks get directly involved, though this may be through the provision of financial products like uh, letters of credit. It might be through uh, acting as a collection bank. Uh, it might be providing guarantees or other types of uh, credit lines. And when banks are involved at this stage, then they have to be particularly careful around potential money laundering because of the scale of what's going on and the particular challenges for uh, trade. Trade is essentially um, a complex business. Uh, for banks, for example, they don't see the goods that they are financing. So if they issue a, line, a letter of credit for a company, they won't see the actual goods that are being delivered. So they have limited visibility. They see the documents and there may be a lot of documents for one trade. So banks have limited visibility for the, the products. They have um, only uh, the documents to look at, and they are complex and a lot of them. So there are a lot of opportunities there for trade-based money laundering. I mean, there's a lot of challenges if you're a bank uh, to to tackle this. But before we get into that, are there any um, well-known case studies or examples involving trade-based mon money laundering that you know of that could kind of give our listeners a very specific view on, on this? Yeah, I mean, there are an awful lot of them. Um, right back to the late 80s, Operation Polar Gap was a very famous one. But since then, there have been almost an ongoing list of case studies. They emerged almost almost monthly. Um, and if you look at the big uh, groups like FATF and others, all the people who produce papers on this, you'll see an emerging uh, list of case studies. They tend to follow uh, quite similar patterns. So the case okay, what are these patterns? Well, they will involve, for example, um, criminals are lying about the price of the goods they're shipping. So trade-based money laundering is often about the movement of value. So if I was to sell you something, let's say I owned the Mona Lisa. Uh, just for the clarity, I don't. But if I did and I wanted to sell it to you, what's the correct price? The answer mm. is we don't know. So if I want to transfer value to you, I sell it to you at a very low price so that 
you then can go and sell the Mona Lisa for a higher price. I transfer illicit value to you. But on the other hand, if I want illicit value transferred to me, I sell it to you at a high price. And a lot of goods that have been shipped, there isn't a clear market to, to actually map these prices to. So over and under, under invoicing, you will see a lot of. You will see uh, short and over shipping. So essentially lying about the amount of goods that are being shipped as another okay. way of transferring value. Um, you, you sometimes even see phantom shipping where there's nothing being shipped at all. Um, you may see a whole range of other techniques such as, um, it's not strictly a, a money laundering technique, but U-boating is, is not an uncommon one. Um, what did you call it? U-boating? U-boating, U-boating. In fact, that brings me to a point I wanted to make. Although we talk about trade-based money laundering, really more and more we're talking about trade-based financial crime because uh, trade attracts not just money laundering, but terrorist financing. It, it attracts um, tax evasion. It attracts uh, illegal transactions, fraud, sanctions, proliferation of finance, dual-use goods and others. So there's a whole range of things that banks have to worry about from a trade point of view. So how do banks, how can banks actually tackle this? I mean, you give some line of credit to some goods that are being shipped. You get a lot of documents. How do you know if it's the right price, if it's the right amount, or even if the goods even exist? Like, how should banks actually make sure that they, this is correct? Right. So what they have to do is they're working from the documents in most cases. Um, so they, they may see all the documents, they may see the finance documents, they may see the um, the, uh, the the goods documents related, the trade related documents as well. Um, it depends what they see, but they have to work from that. So there are a number of things they can do. In terms of over and under invoicing, for example, some goods are clearly linked to a market price. So if somebody is shipping, say, sugar, then we know roughly what the market price of sugar is. And we, we can match that and say, well, okay, give or take a bit, that's about the right kind of level. Um, or it might be copper or metals or something like that. So they can, they can then take a view, is that a reasonable kind of price? If it's not something that has its own market, there might be other indicators. For example, weight is a good example. There's a well-known case study of uh, criminals shipping lead, which they claim to be gold. Now, gold and lead have very different weights. So by looking at the weights that are stated on the bills of lading, you can see that this doesn't match the goods that are being shipped. Mm. So there are various things that you can do. You can take uh, uh, technical advice as well. You can, you can look for other tr similar trades. Um, you can look also to see whether the economic underlying purpose makes any sense at all. And anyone who's been in trade at all will see trades that make no sense or that, that, are, that are silly or strange. Um, there's, there's a well-known case of, um, for example, um, there was a shipment of uh, copper, scrap copper from China to the US. Now, first of all, that's a strange shipment. Scrap copper to the US sounds a little odd. So that alerts the bank straight away that there's something might be something funny. And when they look at it, they realize, although this is invoiced as or, or on the uh, bill of lading as scrap copper, the price is a good quality cro copper. Um, so you see a lot of shipments like this that, that don't really make sense. And you can, when I talk about weight, I mean, I've seen examples through US shipping data. There was a well-known one where um, there were briefcases being shipped. Now, standard everyday briefcases being shipped. And when the, the bank analyzed the unit weight of each briefcase, it actually would have come out at something like 120 kilos weight per briefcase, which is absurd. <laughs> so, that uh, doesn't sound like a briefcase I uh, want to you, buy. <laughs> you're going to have to be a strong person to carry that from meeting to meeting. So there's the whole range of things. There's, there's also some other data around silly prices. Um, again, if you look at some of the data that the US have put out, they've seen situations where they've been uh, bulldozers priced at one dollar seventy-two a bulldozer, which is crazy. Yeah. Or that doesn't uh, that doesn't work either. Doesn't work. Or toilet tissue at four thousand dollars a kilo. It's you know it's it's just crazy stuff. So sometimes you get things that are very very extreme and you can pick them up. Sometimes you'll get indications in the documentation where things aren't quite right. Um, and in fact, when we're looking at the kind of things we look out for, we look at we look across 
customer risk. We look at document risk. What might, might we see in there? What might we see things that don't make sense? Transaction risk, payment risk, shipment risk all come into this. So there are but, things uh, that we could do. Yeah, but, you know, we talk about this here now. You know, all the examples that, that you mentioned, it's like, it's obvious. You got to laugh at it almost a little bit. But both of us know that it's easy to talk about like, yeah, it doesn't make sense from the documentation. But when you are a large bank, there are so much, so much trade going on. And these documents aren't necessarily easy to read and understand either. Like, uh, it's actually quite hard in practice to to do all these investigations or um, what kind of systems or new technology have you seen that can make this easier to do and like actually do in practice? Because I can imagine like if it's shipment documents from China, it's in different languages, it's like hard material to work with. It is. And there's been a, a, a lot of work trying to find a way of digitalizing all these documents. Um, and it's not easy to be quite honest. Um, what we are finding is that there, there is a lot of work going on as how to digitalize these things, how to actually make them, how to find systems that will work together and make this easier. But there Do are you think real... GPT, the advances in generative AI will like have a huge impact in this in the years to come? One day, I mean, there yeah. you could easily more benchmark prices and these kinds of things. One day, yes, but we're a long way from that. I mean, we are a very long way from that. Um, first of all, you, you've got to have the legislation in place to support this. So a lot of you know countries are putting in place legislation to help this, but um, it, 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 it's early early days. Um, so we've seen things like you know we've seen things like uh, uh, people putting together stuff for uh, documents. For example, there's the UN. The UN has their model law on electronic transferable records, which they put place in place in 2017, trying to standardize electronic documentation, uh, which sounds like a great idea. But again, take up has been very slow on that. I think last time I looked, I think there were only eight countries involved in that. Um, mm. Other things that are, that are challenging around this is getting this, the right technology in place. So people, there's no point digitalizing in different countries. We have to digitalize internationally. We have to have systems that can talk to each other, agree with each other, understand each other. And it has to be done in a way which is not going to be clunky and very expensive. Um, What's like so, your dream system? What does that look like if you were in charge definitely. and got to digitalize like the world of uh, trade-based financing now? How, what, where would you start? Well, simply going looking at the documentations is often tedious and it's hard work. You can have over a hundred documents for a trade, um, and they vary. There'll be financial documents, government documents, there'll be trade documents, there'll be a whole range of things. And you're trying to check for for consistency as much as anything else. Um, so you would want to see systems that could do that for you reliably and in, in a way that you could really rely on them. Remember that banks can't get rid of their responsibility by using technology, so they're still responsible. So the technology has to do the job properly. Um, Very so a, good point. Good point yeah. to remember. Yeah. So the systems have to be doing something like that. If you could take the drudgery out of that, that would be fantastic. But they're only as good as the information going in. And a lot of the early research certainly showed that, for example, AI wasn't very good at spotting fake documents. Um, now, they will, AI, will, AI will get better at that, of course, but um, at the moment, that's not really working. So it will be fantastic when we have it, because what we want to use people for are the things people are good at. We are really good at spotting um, unusual anomalies, things that don't quite make sense, that gut instinct, that experience. Now, AI, I hope we'll never get there, but certainly isn't going to get there in my lifetime nor your lifetime. So what we want to do is use technology in a way that will free up the compliance experts, the trade finance experts to do the bits of their job that people are so much better at than machinery ever will be. Talking about technology and systems, so uh, banks already have rigorous KYC processes, uh, transaction monitoring, um, how are in mitigating the risk of trade-based money, la trade money laundering, uh, 
what are you what do you believe are the key components in an effective KYC program for yeah I would well okay um I'm going to say first of all um in my view it's not technology yet it's people um and it's not just my view regulators will support this that to uh be effective in managing uh trade based money laundering trade based financial crime risk then you are relying heavily on having very expert people at the trade finance, the first line of defense level, and very expert people in the compliance level. Um, for example, let me give you one simple example. Dual use goods are a real issue for uh, yeah. banks, you know, so goods that can Maybe have an before, innocent. can we just give one example of dual use uh, goods? So sure. one, uh, one uh, that I usually use, I don't know if you agree, it's like, um, metal pipes it, yes yeah, that absolutely. could also be described to be like a gun barrel yeah. or it could be a metal pipe yeah. maybe you have uh, some other examples going to illustrate the issue for our that's viewers a, that's, i mean that's a, very, that's a very good one i mean that you could things like chlorine for example chlorine is an industrial solvent we use it in our houses um but it's also an extremely vile weapon if it's used as a, in, in its military format um you can think of fertilizer as an obvious example as well but a whole range of things like starter engines, almost anything uh, fits into that dual use goods category. Now, the challenge for banks there is to understand when a dual use good is being used for the wrong purpose. Um, and again, that is where we need experience and expertise to manage that. And sometimes that means external expertise as well. But we need to make sure that we are looking for dual use goods um, in an intelligent and enlightened way. Now, um, those are the kind of things that are, are that is difficult for technology to pick up at the moment. It's also difficult for technology to understand if you're having a conversation with something, something doesn't feel right. Um, give you another example. You know, one famous case um, from the early 2000s revolves a company that uh, at the time it sold circuit chips. Now, at that time, circuit chips was the technology, it was red hot for a while. The late, the late 90s, it was red hot technology. By the time you get to the early 2000s, um, it, the, the technology's crashed. It's been replaced. Anyone trying to sell circuit chips is struggling financially. Um, and this one company selling circuit chips kept going. Didn't just keep going, it thrived. For six years after this crash, it kept going and thriving until somebody eventually asked the question, how? How is this company thriving selling circuit chips when there's no market? And as it turned out, they had set up an entirely fraudulent, illegal trade system. Uh, there was a circular trade. It was fraudulent. It was also money laundering and various other things. So they were living if, off entirely ill-gotten gain. So um, you know, trying to understand those kind of things are very difficult for, in, uh, for uh, monitoring systems. Transaction monitoring is really important particularly for open account trading. Now, just to reiterate, that's when a buyer and a seller do a deal with each other and they only use the bank through their bank accounts. Now, obviously, monitoring that is really important. Screening is vital, sanction screening. Also, it's worth remembering that a trade often takes place over a period of time. So the original sanction screening you might do at the beginning of the trade, you might have to redo that uh, as the trade progresses because things will change. You also need to be alert to uh, third parties, intermediaries. Trades are not very often simply between a buyer and a seller. There, there will be a whole range of people involved in that, like freight forward, customers, agencies, and, and so on, that will be part of that. So part of the challenge for banks is to think about what sort of work do I do for uh, those intermediaries in terms of due diligence? If we are, say, a bank which is issuing a letter of credit, what work do we have to do for the, the suppliers bank, which might be the advising bank. So there are so many uh, players here that it's really important to understand those, to screen them properly, screen them for sanctions, screen them for adverse media, understanding beneficial ownership, understanding that the goods that are being shipped are part of what you would expect. And obviously transaction monitoring is a big part of that as well. So, I mean, I hope that goes some way to answer the question. There's so many things to bring into yeah. this. That we'll, there's it's a lot to a, think about. It's a complex question and also kind of goes back to something uh, we talked about initially that, yeah, this responsibility it kind of falls on the banks who are subject to the anti-money laundering and terror, terrorist financing legislation. But 
uh, what, there's a lot of other players also involved as you nah. trade forward. There's so many inter intermediaries. So how, uh, in order to tackle this problem in the future, how do you see the legislate, the legislative landscape evolving? Should, is it fair that this is only uh, the responsibility of the banks or should we as a society put more responsibilities on other players too? Well, of course, everyone has to uh, comply with sanction legislation and so forth. But beyond that, I'm thinking. Well, it's a very, very good point. And um, actually, of course, everybody in the UK, for example, has to comply with the Proceeds of Crime Act. I think one of the outcomes of uh, really good technology, really good AI may well be that pretty much any business has to come to this level of scrutiny of their business. So um, yes, it, it falls heavily on banks these days. And certainly sometimes it feels like Everything seems to be hitting banks very hard in terms of money laundering controls more than anybody else. There is good reason for that, but it does put a lot of pressure on them. Um, financial systems will help it spread that load because you're right. I, I, if you look at money laundering, then that is that is a huge issue for all sorts of uh, businesses. You also have to realize, I think this is important, that banks are trying to defend themselves against global organized crime and organized crime is it's never existed in the way it exists at the moment because of digitalization because of online work and all these things because of internationalization organized crime globally is incredibly dangerous incredibly well organized um run by very intelligent people and very effective you, uh, for example some of the dutch ports uh the container ports have been pretty much taken over by criminal gangs who run the whole process. How does a bank manage that kind of risk? It's it's almost impossible to do that. So that all the documentation, everything is controlled by organized crime. You also have facilitators of money laundering who are out there issuing um, uh, false documents uh, documentation. Uh, there was a, a big uh, operation went down uh, across Europe and the US uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, exposing a big global uh, trade-based money laundering scheme, and they just they uncovered uh, the law enforcement agencies are covered in several countries. People whose whose living was providing services to these criminal gangs. So if you want to have, say, a fake bill of lading, you contact them. They will build one for you, and it'll be very realistic, and it's very very hard to spot. If you want to have a fake um, invoice, again, same again. Uh, if you want a fake uh, origin, certificate of origin, again, these could be faked incredibly easily. So banks really uh, have a huge amount of work to do. The cost of compliance for banks is through the roof because trying to manage this is very difficult. That's the point at which uh, really effective technology becomes very attractive because the sheer scale and volume of that banks are subject to in terms of compliance here is just eye-watering. And it, it, in order for them to do their business well, they need some kind of uh, technology that's going to help. It's just a shame, as I said, that I think we're still quite a long way away from that. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a very complex problem to solve. And I mean, on organized crime, I've also read shocking reports and news articles, especially from like Belgium and yep, I guess yes. also uh, yep. the Netherlands and. Uh, I mean, it kind of feels a little bit like despite all the regulations and the billions of dollars that have that has been invested over the last decade in this, almost like losing the fight a little bit. But um, are there any positives? C could we leave this episode more on a on a high note instead of feeling uh, feeling like organized crime will will uh, yeah take over our society? Look, I, I spend a lot of time with a lot of banks, a lot of financial institutions. Um, and, you know, one of the things that always impresses me is the determination of people in banks to get this right. Um, not just for regulation, not just for law purposes, but there is a growing understanding um, amongst, amongst the banks involved in this, amongst the trade houses, that what they are doing in terms of money laundering controls, this is not just about ticking a few boxes so we don't get a fine. I'm hearing chief executives of major boards saying, we have to get this right because we're here to protect society. 
from these yeah, criminals. I, I hear that too. And mm. I think that's one of the, why it's also like motivating to work in this industry and why we're yeah. building strides and doing the laundry because you see that really like people really want to move beyond compliance for the sake of compliance or yeah. checkbox compliance. People realize like, wow, this really matters and it has such a big impact on society going forward. So that's also is, yeah, I'm inspired by that too. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, in, in, when you look at the enforcement actions, um, quite often these things lead to people being hurt. You know, I've just actually um, uh, printed off a, an interesting paper on modern slavery, which um, which was it actually been written by my old colleague and a senior colleague from Standard Charter, John Cusack, who writes a lot of these things. And it just illustrating the damage that these criminals do. I mean, this is not trade-based money laundry, but very quickly in Calabria, for example, um, the Calabrian mafia called the Indrangheta took over the entire health service and controlled the thing from, you know, the moment you ring a doctor to the moment you're buried. And that's terrifying. But to finish on back, there's the good note that you want. We are fighting back very hard. And I think that we are getting some degree of international cooperation. Um, regulation now is looking very much the same country to country to country. You look at the laws criminalizing money laundering. I've been in our business 40 years. When I first started out, no one cared about money laundering. It just happened. It just happened. Uh, and there was the famous BCCI scandal, which was a bank pretty much set up to be a money laundering bank. So I think we have made huge strides. What makes it look as though we haven't is that the criminals have made big strides as well. And everything happens fast. But I have great respect for my colleagues in this industry. I think right across the, the whole spectrum in, in ju different jurisdictions, different parts of this industry, there is a real heart for getting this right. And the True. when I first started, that didn't exist. And I think, uh, yeah, we're, we're holding them at bay. But the advantage is always with the crooks. I'm afraid it always is. So we just have to remember that they're as smart as we are, uh, and we just have to try and be a bit smarter. Um, all right, final question. So if any one of our listeners want to educate themselves a bit more on trade-based money laundering or want to dig into like what this problem is, uh, do you have any uh, resources that you would recommend? Book, YouTube channel, articles, like where would you, which direction would you point them? Well, CCL Academy, where I work, has we have a huge amount of resources. I mean, we, we, we carry out training on a public basis, so the public I do public trade courses that people could attend. Um, we have online videos. We have a whole suite of videos addressing a whole range of compliance topics, including this. We have e-learning and we write papers. I write papers which go out onto LinkedIn and others. So follow CCL Academy would be definitely part of what I suggest. The, the, so the challenge with trade is trying to find, get your head around the whole picture. And it takes time. I've been lucky. I've worked with some fantastic people in my time and, and that really helps you to understand it. Um, perhaps try and perhaps the first stage would be to make sure you understand trade itself. So find some information on letters of credit. What are they? Uh, you could Google those. That's easy enough to find them. Find out what guarantees are. Find out um, what the variations on letters of credit like, you know, back-to-back um, -back letters of credit, standby letters of credit, things like that, how they all work. Because until you understand those kind of things, you're not going to understand how this could be used for money law. Well, uh, it was a pleasure having you on the laundry, uh, Bruce. Well, thank I learned you for having me. a lot about the challenging world of trade-based money laundering. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Pleasure being here.